Welcome to this episode of History Hunters. It's going to be a special Veterans Day tribute. I'm out here at the Cherokee Memorial Park in Lodi, California, and I'm here specifically to highlight uh, one significant veteran who was here, a Vietnam veteran who was decorated by President Lyndon Johnson with the Medal of Honor. I'm also here to highlight a World War I veteran by the name of Bertus Rumsey, who was actually one of the original cast members of Gunsmoke. I'm also here to look at the final resting place of a 1960s music star who was the founding member of the Five Americans. It was a band that had a couple of hits. There's another veteran who is buried here. He was stationed up in Washington. His son is probably somebody that history would like to forget because he was involved with one of the first school shootings in the United States, that of Patrick Purdy. Also found out that there's a World War I veteran who <laughs> was a congressman from North Dakota of all places. He's buried here. Join us on this episode of History Headers. So one of the main entrances to the cemetery is right down here. And you come down to this main drive and right here, this grave by this trash can is World War I veteran Bertus Rumsey, who played Sam the Bartender, the first Sam the Bartender, in the TV series Gunsmoke. He's right here, Bertus Harwood Burt Rumsey III. How do you like that name, Bertus? He was a corporal in the 15th Cavalry in World War I. I understand this regiment sailed for France. That's one of the four mounted regiments on duty with the Allied Expeditionary Force. The fighting had already bogged down into trench warfare, and the role of the horse cavalry was nearly over. The 15th was called upon to dismount and relieve the exhausted infantry troops in the trenches. It was the tank that finally broke the trench lines to end the war and that of the horse soldier. The 15th served occupation duty after the war until June of 1919 when it returned home. Now Rumsey played Sam Noonan, the bartender, on the TV series Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke, of course, started as a radio show in 1952 and was adapted for TV in 1955. Now, Rumsey only appeared in Gunsmoke for three years, from 1956 to 59. A lot of you Gunsmoke fans probably think of Sam the Bartender as being Glenn Strange, and he certainly was probably the better known of the Sam the Bartender, but it was Burtis who played the first Sam the Bartender. He also appeared in several movies in the 1950s, including Botany Bay, Desert Hell, and The Girls in Lover's Lane. He appeared in two 1960s films, The Threat and Ship of Fools. In addition to appearing on Gunsmoke, he also appeared in an episode of The Cisco Kid with Duncan Ronaldo in the early 1950s. Now this cemetery backs up to Highway 99. I've probably traveled by this cemetery millions of times going up and down the freeway there, but uh, first time here, it's kind of interesting. So much history here. Right there's an Air Force veteran. I thanked him. He was over here looking at a grave and it's that of his daughter. I thanked him for his service. Now there's the den of Highway 99 right here, but I want to focus on this grave right here. Otto Kruger. He's a World War I veteran. It doesn't say that on his marker, but you can see that uh, he was born in 1890 and he died in 1963. And his wife Ella is here as well. Now, he was a private in the infantry from April 1918 to May of 1919 with overseas service in the 91st Division. This is Otto Kruger, who served as a U.S. congressman from North Dakota. How he ended up here in Lodi is because he settled here. He wanted a farm and he wanted to go into accounting here after he retired from politics. Now, he was born to German parents in southwest Russia in 1890 and attended grade in high school in Russian and German schools and came to the U.S. in 1910 and settled in Fessenden, North Dakota, attended business school in Fargo, North Dakota and Great Falls, Montana. He served as a local official in North Dakota starting in 1920 and later became the state treasurer and North Dakota insurance commissioner. He was elected as a Republican to Congress in 1953. Now, Congressman Kruger is one of the Republicans who supported civil rights in the 1950s. Didn't really catch on until the 1960s. There were some obstructionists, segregationist Democrats in Congress who didn't want to see civil rights passed. So that's a black eye on that party. 
this cemetery, like a lot of cemeteries across the country, are full of veterans. Harold Hart, for example, he was from Kansas. He was a private in the Army, World War II. We have Herbert Hare. He was a private, also in World War II, died in 75. I'm not too sure that there are any World War II veterans still alive today. It's possible, but they, they must be rare. There's another veteran, Leslie Connor from California. is a quartermaster of the U.S. Naval Reserve, if I'm reading that right. World War I. Died in 61, the year I was born. This cemetery has a very nice um, section here devoted to the veterans. And this is where we're gonna find Richard Pittman. Sitting on top of this block of granite is a majestic eagle carrying the American flags. Pretty cool. This is the primary grave that we came for, Richard A. Pettman, 1945 to 2016. He was a Stockton boy who graduated from Franklin High School in Stockton in June 1964. Of course, Vietnam was turning up by then. He was turned down by the Army and Navy because he was legally blind in one eye, but the Marines took him in 1965 and shipped him off to Vietnam in February 1966. Pittman was honored at the White House by President Lyndon Johnson on May 14, 1968, who gave him the Medal of Honor for his heroic actions in the Vietnam War, specifically on July 24, 1966. A lot of you have probably seen the movie Forrest Gump, and a lot of veterans have said that that movie is very realistic. Richard Pittman lived that in real life. They were going down this narrow jungle trail, and the lead Marines were being cut down by enemy fire. Richard jumped right into action. He moved forward, took on his new ammo belt and his uh, machine gun, and he went, went into action. He was able to disable the enemy from continuing their attack on the lead troops that were marching in. He learned there were more wounded Marines 50 yards up the trail, and he braved a hail of enemy mortar and small arms fire to run forward. When he reached his fallen comrades, he was confronted with a front bold attack of about 30 to 40 Viet Cong. He disregarded his own safety and calmly established a position in the middle of the trail and raked the advancing enemy with devastating machine gun fire. When his weapon jammed, he picked up a submachine gun and together with a pistol seized from a fallen Marine, continued blasting away until the enemy withdrew. After he ran out of ammo, he threw a grenade at the enemy and rejoined his own platoon. I threw the grenade and uh, the, I after the explosion, they just left. I didn't. I don't know whether they pulled back. I killed them all, or I don't know. Who knows how many American lives that he saved that day? I have a quote here from the L.A. Times. He told the L.A. Times, "I just did it. I knew somebody had to do it. Combat was kind of always instinctive to me. A true war hero. Now, whether or not you believe in war, he did his job. He fought for his country." And a lot of those guys came back. My uncle was one of them. They were not welcome back. They were seen as baby killers. A lot of war protesters uh, just add to the misery. You know, being in war is bad enough, but to come home as a dejected person. Killing was something that I didn't want to do, but based on the circumstances, I had to do that. He continued to serve his country, became a postal clerk at Camp Pendleton where he was promoted to sergeant in late 1967. He was discharged from active duty on April 5th, 1968. And the following month, he was decorated by LBJ himself. In 1970, he re-enlisted in the Marine Corps and he was promoted to the final rank of Master Sergeant during his 21-year career. He retired in 1988 and passed away in Stockton at the age of 71. When they built the VA hospital in French camp, they named the facility for Pittman. And there's also a charter school in Stockton named after him. Of course, service to our country 
takes many forms. This is a California Highway Patrol officer, John Paul Miller, died very young. Now this is a very interesting place. We're gonna find the grave of 1960s rock star Norm Ezel. He's actually been cremated and uh, it's a very interesting little place over here and uh, it took me a while to find it, but he's on post number one. And I'm not sure if the cremains are buried in the post or they're buried out here in the landscaping. But uh, a very, very small plaque here for Norm Ezel, 1941 to 2010. He was a rhythm guitarist. He was a founding member of the music group, The Five Americans, whose biggest hit was Western Union. You probably remember that song. Five Americans appeared on TV shows in the 1960s like American Bandstand, Where the Action Is, and Shindig. They also performed in concerts with the Dave Clark Five, Sonny and Cher, the Everly Brothers, Glenn Campbell, the Birds, and Herman's Hermits. The Five Americans initially played instrumental surfing music in Oklahoma, of all places, during the 1960s. He partly wrote the lyrics for Western Union. He found God in 1975 and moved to Lodi in 2002, where he was an active member of the Zion Christian Fellowship on South Central Avenue. He also switched from rock and roll to Christian rock music. Like a lot of rock stars, Norm Ezell had some issues when he was dealing with his fame. There was a lot of drugs, there was a lot of alcohol, there was a lot of women, and uh, he found an empty lifestyle. And uh, he gave his Christian testimony and told about all the, uh, the ordeals that he went through spiritually. And he finally found God, made peace with God, and then he started battling with cancer. Isn't that the way it always seems to be? Somebody gets their life figured out and then they've got to deal with something like that. So on the wall here, it says uh, Cascade Garden. And uh, I really like this poem here, author unknown, Time to Pray. I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't take the time to pray. Problems just humbled about me and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on, gray and black. I wondered why God didn't show me. He said, but you didn't see. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, my child, you didn't knock. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. Life is so incredibly busy these days, and I think a lot of us would benefit <laughs> we just put that one into practice. So I entered this cemetery over here, and then you curve around here, just north of the Evergreen Chapel is a headstone for two people. We have a veteran of the Army Patrick Benjamin Purdy, 1944 to 1981, and his son, Patrick Edward Purdy. You may remember that name because he was the Cleveland school shooter. He was 26 when he single-handedly staged one of the first school shootings in the country. He's buried here with his father. He was a veteran who was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington when Patrick was born. On September 13, 1981, Purdy's father was killed after being struck by a car, and his family filed a wrongful death suit against the driver, seeking $600,000 in damages, but the suit was dismissed. Little Patrick's mother was reportedly abusive, and the kid became violent and a drug addict and an alcoholic, and one neighbor recalled the time that Patrick chased her sons around with a butcher knife. When he was 21, Purdy told a mental health professional that he had destructive thoughts. He was considered to have an antisocial personality, but he never received any long-term mental health intervention. On January 17, 1989, he drove to Cleveland School at 11.40, dressed in 
combat fatigues and armed with a, a weapon and two handguns. He set his car on fire, creating a diversion while he broke onto the campus and began firing at kids for two minutes on the playground during recess. He fired about 106 rounds before taking the carrot's way out with one round to the head. Patrick Purdy had a history of arrest, mental illness, and alcohol-related problems, but no one could have predicted that he would do such a horrible thing. Americans were just horrified. I mean, we weren't used to such things, but now it's become so commonplace. Really, really tragic. So that's gonna wrap up this visit to Cherokee Memorial Park in Lodi, California for a Veterans Day tribute. Uh, if you know a veteran, tell them thanks. I know it may seem corny, but uh, these guys served their country when they were called on and um, they need to be recognized for it. So to all your veterans out there, thank you for your service.